Addressing population shouldn't be radioactive. Well, duh. But it is, and it has been for nearly 30 years. We'll talk about this and more with Valerie Allen, author of the new book, Eight Billion Reasons Population Matters. Next. Call in, call in, call in, call in, call in, call in. Call the growth buster. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Welcome to the Growth Busters podcast, where we roast the growth pushers and toast the transition towns, degrowthers, steady staters, child free, and others who get that there are limits to growth and small is beautiful. I'm Dave Gardner, director of the documentary Growth Busters Hooked on Growth, and founder and senior counselor here at the Center for Growth Addiction Recovery. And I'm Stephanie Gardner, Growth Busters advisor, environmental law and policy wonk, and sustainable energy devotee. You'll find us at growthbusters.org. Search for Growth Busters on Facebook, Twitter, and of course your podcast app for the latest growth busting news. We have some very interesting growth busting news and listener feedback to share with you in this episode, so be sure to stay with us after the conversation with our guest. We recorded this episode the day before World Population Day of 2022, July 11th. So it's only appropriate to focus on human overpopulation in this episode. Stephanie, did you know the world is overpopulated? I think I might have had a clue about that. (laughs) Well, it's a wonder that you do. And one of the topics we'll visit in this episode is the avoidance of the subject of overpopulation in the world over the last 30 years. So I really want to highlight that. As usual, the United Nations is beating around the bush on World Population Day. The UNFPA World Population Day Statement 2022 and the World Population Day Statement from UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres are both classic cases of political correctness to such an extreme that they are trash, completely worthless. That's right, you heard it here. No more Mr. Nice Guy. And we'll probably talk more about them with our guest. Now, Valerie Allen has been an advocate for sustainable population for a long time, long enough to have written not one, but two books about overpopulation. Her most recent, hot off the press, is Eight Billion Reasons Population Matters, the defining issue of the 21st century. Valerie, thanks so much for joining us today. Just to start off, can you summarize the state of the world? What is it that inspires your life of activism? Well, you know, Dave, I've always had a soft spot for animals. And I think it was, you know, in the early 70s, I heard about the population issue shortly after Paul Ehrlich wrote his book and influenced so many people. Mm -hmm. And um, it was at that time that I made the connection between all of the extinction of species and the um, animal agriculture that was causing so much pain and suffering for animals, well, still is, of course, and how animals were treated. And since that time, I've been working with population groups and animal rights groups and environment groups. And so I've just decided to devote these two books to the animals and speak out for them because... They have no voice. That's a really inspiring story. The fact that you looked at the world around you and said, this isn't right, and decided to actually act on that, that's pretty incredible. I think we're going to spend most of the time today talking about your most recent book, but can you tell us a little bit about your first book, Growing Pains, A Planet in Distress? That was a a long time coming, that book. It took a long period of research, like this one did as well, but... um, I think that somebody seemed to like the book. Because of that book, I was invited to be a keynote speaker at a Critical World Issues conference in England at Oxford. And it was a wonderful experience because being the keynote speaker, it kind of set the tone for the whole conference of five days and all the speakers there. And I realized that they were all trying to connect the dots to population and when they the speakers that were addressing climate change and extinction of species and human trafficking and water issues and many, many other critical world issues, they seemed to make that connection. And I just came away from that meeting really pumped because it was confirmation that if people are aware of an issue, they will connect the dots. They will make that connection. And 
so I learned a lot from them as well, and I, I think that they learned a lot about the connection there. So why a second book? Well, the first book was basically designed for the lay audience. It was my first attempt, not quite as polished as this book. And the difference for this book is that it was also designed for the education system. I worked with the, the Nippon Institute of Technology for many years, and I realized that something that was missing in the population issue was they didn't have the connection between many of the other issues and population. And I thought that that was something that was badly needed, is to make that connection in the education system. And when I work with scientists in the classroom, I realized it is on their curriculum, that population, in even in high school and in college, is on the curriculum. And so it just shocked me that many teachers are choosing not to address the issue. And so I thought, well, if this book could be used, even in a small way, it would make a huge difference. And so I designed all of the Critical World Issues chapters to stand alone, because I've been told that educators are now assigning chapters rather than whole books in a lot of cases. And so this book is designed for both the lay audience and the education system. That ex certainly explains why this is, you could have called this book Encyclopedia of Overpopulation. <laughs> well, it took four years to write, so that says a lot. Uh, because I had never written an educational book before, and uh, I had to do a bit of research. I even went back to college to find out what the students wanted and what they were looking for and how that operated and that's where i found out about the chapters being assigned now huh. and so uh yeah i put a lot of effort into it uh, it's 388 pages down from almost 600 and <laughs> so it, it was a lot of work just reducing the size but i'm hoping i covered everything that's important well val these struck me as the two main missions of the book, and so I want to see if you would agree with that. One would be to bring overpopulation back into the conversation, and, and you wrote in the book that we need traditional media and environmental groups to, quote, get on board. And uh, mission number two would be to unite the world in a project to stop growth at 8 billion, to make population peak at 8 billion as early as 2025, and then start to contract. Did I get that right? Yes, I think you're right on there. And, you know, I don't know what happened to it, but back in the 70s, population was the buzzword. I mean, it was being used everywhere. It was the conversation. It was, you know, what promoted Earth Day. The first Earth Day was designed around the population issue and the impacts it was having on so many other issues. And I remember talking about it in high school, even. It was part of the hippie movement and, and part of the, the whole mentality of those days of thinking that, you know, we could really have the power to change things. The, the hippie movement had a lot of power and made us realize that, that we could make a difference. And then it just sort of went underground. And I think there were a lot of factors that caused that to happen. Of course, the Vietnam War and then religious backlash and political issues. There were a lot of issues. I've talked about it a lot in my book. And so it just went off the radar. And it, it was a crying shame, I think, because, you know, it really had built up a lot of momentum. So what I'm hoping with these books, but especially this last one, because it's just so critical right now, is that we can get the conversation started again. And your wonderful show has also worked a lot towards that end. And so I'm hoping that with all the population groups, you know, working on the same issue for so many years and putting so much energy into it, I think that we've reached a point where it's close to that critical mass where we are going to start making a difference now. So maybe you can give us a few more details about it. You're right that it was part of the conversation back in uh, the early 1970s. Can you 
pinpoint for us uh, kind of at a high level the things that you think really caused it to go underground? Well, I'm not sure why, but I think that environment groups that used to address the issue have sort of backed off. For example, Greenpeace, their motto used to be stop at two, and that disappeared. And, you know, a lot of other groups that were working on it sort of backed off. I mean, it's still on their agenda, but they're not putting as much effort into it. And uh, I think that's one of the big issues, is we really need to address that and start networking more with environment groups to get them back on board. What do you think it's going to take to get them to touch the issue? Because there is some sort of, I guess, phobia or taboo about it, which is the reason why they haven't wanted to address it. So what do you think it, it might take Is it just convincing them? Well, I think convincing them, of course. I think networking and set up forms of networking like Thriving Together and some of these other, you know, conferences. What I would really like to see is a North American conference on population that's separate from the UN conferences. That's something that's grassroots and put together by people and groups that are really concerned and bring in experts and bring in population people, bring in the key environmental group leaders. We could even include, you know, the uh, corporate people and, and government people. But I think it has to be spearheaded and focused on a grassroots project. And that's something that I would really like to see. Well, not depending on the UN might be a smart move. You wrote uh, quite a bit about the 1994 International Conference on Population and Development. A lot of people know that as the Cairo Conference. And it seemed to me like you thought a lot of good things happened there. But didn't some bad things happen too? In fact, I've heard that a deal was made that the overdeveloped rich world would stop talking about overpopulation and the yet to be overdeveloped world would then stop talking about the overconsumption of the rich world. There was a little bit of division and both sides decided, well, we're not going to complain about what the other side's doing. Did you hear that? Yes. (laughs) Short answer? Well, that's been a huge issue. And what concerns me is that they've made it into an either or issue. Mm -hmm. It's either population or it's consumption. And it's an and, you know, it's population and consumption. And I don't think that any population group would deny that consumption is a huge part of the conversation and um, that we really have to address both. The problem is that there is a big conversation already around consumption and there isn't around population. And so I think that's why population groups are pushing it so hard. Yeah. Is because it's just lacking. Uh, You know, there's no balance there. It needs a champion. And I think that a lot of the environmental groups tend to be pretty progressive. And I think they got sensitive about the, and there's some guilt that, you know, that the people in the rich world are over consuming like crazy and uh, pretty much screwing up the planet and the conditions in the less rich world. And there was a misassumption developed was that uh, because fertility rates were a lot higher in the yet to be overdeveloped world, that that was where the population problem was. And so people were misassuming that people in the rich world were blaming people in the not so rich world for having too many babies while meanwhile they over consumed like crazy with abandon and no sense of environmental responsibility and I say that I, I'm calling that a misassumption I mean certainly there was some of that going on but I certainly don't think that's present today uh, I think we have a very enlightened sustainable population movement, and they understand that it's more complex and that overconsumption is an issue, and that because we're such big overconsumers in the rich world, that that means we have a population problem too. We're overpopulated because unless and until we get our consumption levels way back down to a reasonable level, there's too many of us doing that overconsuming. Well, you're absolutely right. And I think you know, that statistic of 40% of pregnancies are unintended globally. 
That means in every country. This isn't just a problem that's off in Africa somewhere. We are dealing with it ourselves, even in Canada. Mm -hmm. According to Population Institute Canada, we are overpopulated. And there are a lot of indicators showing that, like depletion of our forests. We only have 6% of our old growth forests left. Uh, depletion of our fisheries and our topsoil and all other kinds of issues that are based on overpopulation. And, you know, when you look at the map of Canada and, and you think, oh my gosh, that's a huge country. Look at all the space for more people there. But th what people don't realize is that most of Canada is not habitable. And that's why most of the population is right along the U.S. border. Um, and the farther north you go, of course, the more resources it requires, especially for energy, just to, just to keep warm. The other issue is people don't understand that if someone, say, from Calcutta is moving to Calgary, for example, they are going to require a lot more resources. You know, all the stuff to, is to keep warm and stay alive, like, um, you know, hats and coats and boots and furnaces and insulated houses and all these things compared to them not needing most of those things in a warmer climate. And our growing season is much shorter, so there's uh, uh, going to be a food issue and a lot of our food will have to be imported. You know, even though the fertility rate in North America is below two today, and it's quite a bit higher than, than that in Africa, uh, I certainly am aware of plenty of people in North America who are having three or four kids today. Uh, there are some, and, and it's because I think they're just blissfully unaware that we're in overshoot for one and that we are, are overpopulated. And, and since each child that we add to the planet in the overdeveloped world has such a huge footprint, it's just really critical that the conversation come back, that we stop hiding from the subject of population. Everybody around the world, wherever they live, needs to be acutely aware that we're overpopulated so that they can make more informed decisions about family size. Exactly. And so I think, you know, family planning is an old term that's been used for years, and yet we're not addressing it. Yeah, not doing a good job of it. No, even in schools. I mean, we talk about sex education now in schools, but we rarely discuss family planning or the impact that each child is going to have on the environment or the impact the changing climate is going to have on our children. And so... I mean, this is uh, an issue, as you say, that we really have to start discussing. Before we uh, leave the UN too far behind in the conversation, there's one more thing I want to say about the UN, because I'm particularly unhappy with the United Nations. Every year on World Population Day, I'm disappointed, because this is the organization that owns <laughs> World Population Day. They declared it a day, and there's always a statement from the Secretary General, and, and UNFPA puts out a, a statement on World Population Day. And if on that occasion they can't be honest with the world about the true state of the world, and there's just no denying that we're overpopulated, then how are we supposed to have that conversation? And this year, it's I think it's worse than ever. On the UNFPA's World Population Day Statement 2022, we'll put a link in the show notes, they write, World Population Day offers a moment to celebrate human progress. And they say, uh, focusing only on population numbers and growth rates often leads to coercive and counterproductive measures and the erosion of human rights. For example, to women being pressured to have children or prevented from doing so. There may be more people in the world today, but equally important is the unprecedented demographic diversity we see within the global population. They seem to be going out of their way to keep the subject from being... We would have much better lives for everyone today and in the future if there were fewer of us. And I think it does a disservice to the whole conversation to say that they often lead to coercive and counterproductive measures. They have led to coercive and counterproductive measures. Those have been somewhat isolated instances in the past. They're still going on in some respects, but, but having a 
an enlightened, informed conversation about that can reduce those further. And and it really hurts the cause of sustainable population advocacy to imply that that's what happens if you decide to worry about how many people there are on the planet. Because there's the best response to knowing that the world is overpopulated is to support family planning, to make sure it's uh, very accessible and available to every woman around the planet, to empower women to, you know, make their own informed decisions about family size and not be pressured by culture or economists or government or husbands, you know, to make more babies, to make more consumers, more soldiers, more taxpayers, more conversation would support that. And when the UN brushes it under the rug and tap dances around it, they're really hurting the cause. Forgive my rant. No, you're exactly right. And I think um, that a lot of people use that problem of coercive measures being used, and most of them bring up China. And they don't realize that that's decades ago. I mean, most of those kind of things are not happening today. And we can look at countries that actually have brought about a huge decline in their fertility rates. You know, countries like Japan and Thailand and Iran and the Bhutan and many parts of Europe where they have not used coercive measures. And I just think if we took all the success stories, I put a lot of success stories in my book, if we put them all in a hat <laughs> and every country picked one and did that, I mean, that would solve a lot of our problems because there's no need for coercive measures at all. And um, all these countries have proven that. So I think that's it's too bad that that lingers, that stigma from the past is still lingering, but we can rectify that, I think. And so that's something we really do need to bring up in every conversation about population. You know, we wrote in the book that we need a conversation, and we were going to ask you, why do we need a conversation? But we've just answered that. We need a conversation because there's just misassumptions and misinformation, and that conversation is how people can make more informed decisions. So that's been done. So Val, you have this proposal to basically cap the population at 8 billion by 2025, and then, and then starting a contraction from that point. How did you arrive at that goal? Well, for one thing, the urgency of the issue, uh, seeing how desperate it's become and the impact that we're having on other species, for example. I mean, humans now make up a biomass of mammals of 96% with humans and their uh, farm animals. And we've left only 4% for other mammal species. And I just think that is beyond insane <laughs> because we're causing so many extinctions. So if we don't deal with the issue now, I, I think uh, we're, we're going to really regret it in the future. And that's something that future generations are not going to forgive us. And, you know, they'll look back and say, why didn't you do something? And the other issue is the climate change issue. I mean, looking at the 1.5 degree increase compared to the 2 degree increase, if we're going to even reach 2 degrees, we are going to have to do it within the next five years. So that's why I'm setting that goal. And if we don't have a goal, that we won't have anything to really try and achieve. And it, it won't give people that sense of urgency that we need right now yeah. to tackle the issue. You're right. And I want to interject for the people who aren't familiar with the metric system that uh, two degrees is what, 3.7 degrees Fahrenheit, if I remember correctly. So that's a bigger number to uh, people in the United States who just couldn't get their act together on the metric system. <laughs> and so we're on the verge of hitting 8 billion. You know, we're, it's right around the corner. It'll happen later this year, or some people think maybe next year. So we're about to pass through it, and it would be nice if we didn't keep on heading up to 9 billion. But it's a tall order to, to bend the curve that soon, and we would definitely have to have some better conversations about it. And I think for some people, it will be important to know that 8 billion is crazy. You know, even with 
you know, half the people on the planet living very meager existences compared to those of us in, the, in North America, especially, we're almost engaged in two-planet living today. According to Global Footprint Network, we're making almost twice the demands on the planet that she can sustainably meet year after year with any hope of having a healthy planet for future generations. So uh, we can't stay at 8 billion uh, we've got to get back down. And you searched for the best scientific estimates, Val, of what a sustainable world population would be. Uh, what struck you as the best number in your research? Well, yes, um, looking at some of the think tanks, some of the university studies, the population groups, and other distinguished uh, thinkers, and and putting this all together, you know, most of them are in agreement that between two and three billion would be a sustainable number. Some think it's a lot less. But, you know, I don't think we should be wasting time arguing about is it 2 billion or is it 3 billion? Does it really matter at this point? We're way, way over. Yeah, we know which direction we need to go, huh? Exactly. Shouldn't we start acting on it now? Why are we still arguing about it? And so, yeah, I think sometimes that's used as a reason to keep putting it off. And it's not a legitimate reason, really. Yeah. And okay, we, we have these goals, stop at 8 billion, start contracting toward two or 3 billion. And now starting to think about how do we get there? You talk a little bit about leadership to do this to achieve this. And you have some interesting perspectives around gender and leadership and men versus women being in charge. Do you mind kind of explaining your thoughts on that? Yeah, what's up with that? <laughs> 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 oh, I'm going to get in trouble here. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think the pendulum has swung so far towards, you know, the testosterone-driven world. And I think that we really need to have a little bit more nurturing and gentle and kind and understanding, compassionate world, which tends to be a, a more female-driven world. And so... I'm thinking we need the pendulum to swing the opposite direction for a while and then reach a balance in the middle. But we really have a lot of catching up to do on the women's side. If we want to bring about a more peaceful world, uh, a world where women have the decisions over their own bodies, like I can guarantee you that this decision of Roe versus Wade in the States, if that decision was left up to mostly a women on the board making the decision, we would have had a totally different outcome. Mm. And so I think that, you know, decisions like this and decisions about war and decisions about child care and family planning and many other issues that could use a woman's influence, I think, would be much better made on, on a planet where women are either equal or have a little bit more say in the issue until we can catch up and, and get a balance of things. You're being pretty diplomatic about it, too. I'll just come out and say it. We men have been in charge a long time, and we have really screwed things up. We had our chance. Well, I won't disagree with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I'm bought in. I'm bought in, Val, on your vision. <laughs> I like it. And we're really competitive, too. Uh, I don't think I'm that competitive, but men tend to be in this whole idea of cities competing to be the fastest growing and nations competing to have the biggest economy. You know, that's all oh, that's killing the planet. Our only hope is with you women. <laughs> I mean, we have a lot of men champions for sure. I mean, people like you and Bill Ryerson with the population media and Julian Cribb, of course, that wrote that in his book. And, and over the years, of course, you know, Paul Ehrlich and, and Malthus and, and all these people who have championed women. So, I mean, it's not as if they aren't doing their part. And then now with this Roe versus Wade, we are starting to see men stepping up, men starting to take responsibility and, and getting vasectomies. In Miami, one of the doctors there, Dr. Stein, he said, since that decision was made by the Supreme Court, the number of people coming to his clinic, the number of men for vasectomies has tripled. Finally. And so I think, you know, there are... A lot of possibilities, and I still have a lot of hope. 
explore things. Yeah, you mentioned uh, Julian Cribb and, and his book, Surviving the 21st Century, which sounds really interesting. Uh, I'll try to remember to maybe put a link to that book. I haven't read it. But I know from your book that you and Julian are pretty high on Greta Thunberg. Uh, and I wanted to ask you about that because I haven't heard Greta discuss overpopulation or population growth. So why? what is it that makes you hopeful about Greta, Extinction Rebellion? I don't think they're addressing this issue either. It seems to me that they're avoiding the subject as much as the mainstream environmental organizations. Well, the way I see it, Greta's thinking is very logical. It's based on fact and science, and I love that about her. And actually, according to Michael Bayliss with um, Sustainable Population in Australia, Greta did say, infinite growth on a finite planet is a fantasy. And so I'm thinking, you know, it's a matter of time. She obviously <laughs> recognizes the problem. Yeah. And um, I bet she is just so overwhelmed with climate change and all her traveling and her speaking. But I do believe that at some point she is going to champion the cause. But in the meantime, there are other people that I think, you know, could step up, like Leonardo DiCaprio. He's already expressed his concern about population and made a commitment to a small family. And also people like Phoebe Gates, Bill Gates' daughter, she recently started a petition, you know, after the Roe versus Wade, you know, a petition for women's rights. And I know she's going to university right now, but she might not have a lot of time, but I think eventually she is going to join this movement. And I think she would be a wonderful person. But I'm sure there are lots of young people out there with that potential, and it's a matter of finding some that are willing to champion the cause and speak out and that would really do a big service for the population movement. Yeah, we just need to keep the naysayers who keep trying to keep population brushed under the rug. We just need to keep them from standing in the way of intelligent conversations so that people like Greta can understand that addressing overpopulation isn't an oppressive, coercive, uh, racist, xenophobic, uh, eugenicist uh, agenda. You know, all the misinformation out there that makes people reluctant to talk about the subject. Exactly. It's it's pretty impressive that Greta talked about growth. Mm -hmm. You know, I, th I do think that that's a good start. And you know, Val, I wanted to talk a little bit with you about your perspectives on growth, because that, that also seems to be something that mainstream environmental organizations don't want to touch. God forbid we say anything about the current economic system that turns a lot of people away. But you, you talk about economics and you wrote, ending growth doesn't mean shutting down economic activity or that basic living standards need to take a hit. With a sustainable population and an effective economic system, you mentioned GPI, we could be living an ideal lifestyle with the best of what the planet has to offer while still caring for our environment that sustains us. Surviving the 21st century may not be as difficult as we have been told. So can you explain a little bit more about that perspective that you have? Yes, well, I do believe that. Absolutely, that if we were to reach a sustainable population level, life would change totally from the way it is now. Um, and if we could change our economic system, because the GDP is such a flawed system, it does not address the environmental impacts or the population impacts. And there is a much better system out there called the Genuine Progress Indicator that has been used by some uh, businesses and groups and is very effective. And it does include and factor in environmental impacts and the, the impact of population. So I think that that is one thing that really needs to change is our economic system. And our thinking, our whole thinking of this American dream and the whole illusion of it all that, you know, the more we possess, the happier we're going to be, which a lot of people are finding out is, is false. So we, we have a lot of things to change. And I, I think also the eco side that's taking place on the planet right now, if the United Nations would 
recognize ecocide, which is the destruction of our ecosystems on a mass scale, uh, and hold companies and governments accountable for it, then I think it would be much easier to reach that sustainable population level. Yeah, you have some great proposals in this book. Since we're uh, publishing this episode on World Population Day, I think we should ask you about your proposal for World Depopulation Day, which I think is a great idea. Tell us about that. Well, once we reach that critical level of depopulation, and, uh, well, we will all know when it happens because we'll see it on the population websites. Anyone that has a population counter will we'll see the population start to decrease. And I I think that's going to be a historic moment because uh, that's when we finally do have hope and something to celebrate. And things are going to get much better in so many ways. Well, in every way, really, because population affects every critical world issue. Yep, it's great. And we can also give back some of the land to uh, the wildlife so we don't have to have any more species become extinct. So I think that the degrowth is going to be the best thing we could possibly do, better than than any other act that the United Nations could make, for sure. And so that should be our focus and, and their focus, and we should make it an urgent issue. Couldn't agree more. So Val, you know, I think maybe a good marketing campaign might be necessary to get this conversation started. Do you have any ideas for for a good slogan or what kind of marketing we we need to put on this thing? Did you write stop growth at 8 billion? Is that your proposal? That's definitely my proposal because I think if we go beyond 8 billion, it's going to be probably too difficult for even the next generation, even with all their passion that they have, I mean, they're not going to be able to bring things back. It'll be beyond a level where we can stop the extinction of species, where we can stop the melting of the polar ice field. So if we don't stop at 8 billion, I just think we're leaving behind a legacy of failure. And, you know, the next generations won't forgive us for that. We will be creating a life for them that has no uh, options, that they are going to feel totally hopeless. And I, I just don't think that's fair. We have no right to do that to the next generation or to the other species that are living on the planet. Very well said. So your newest book, uh, Eight Billion Reasons Population Matters, we'll put a link in the show notes to take people to that if they want to buy that book. And you've got a website. I don't know. You've, how long have you had your website, PopulationInSync.net, going? Well, I started it shortly after I published my first book, which was 2010. It's been around for a while, but it still needs work. (laughs) But one of the things I'm proud of on that site is all the quotes. One of the quotes in particular by Martin Luther King, we know him for his I Have a Dream speech, but he also made a speech on population, which I think is really important, and I'd like people to go to my website and check that one out. Another one on there... Because I hear so many people saying, you know, technology is going to bail us out. And as far as I can see, there's no chance of that, really. And so the United Nations made uh, a quote, the family planning could bring more benefits to more people at less cost than any other single technology available to the human race. I think that kind of says it all, too, because alternative energies are not the superheroes that we've been sold. We can't expect technology to bail us out, and we don't need any new technology because we have all the solutions right in my book. (laughs) Thank you so much, Val. It's really been a pleasure speaking with you and getting to know your book. 
Oh, well, thank you both. It's been an honor to be on this show. I've been watching these podcasts and following your website for so long, Dave, and getting your emails, you know, all the time. So I just uh, really admire you, and thank you so much. Now, don't go away. We have very interesting growth-busting news and listener feedback coming up next. That would be so cool if world population were to peak at 8 billion and be well on its way down by the end of this century. Well, I'm all in for that, Stephanie. It's You know that for a long time I've advocated that we really need a global project made up of really many national projects to shrink the scale of the human enterprise. I'm not the only one, and there's been some conversations about memes and slogans and project names. Chris Tucker's P3B for population 3 billion. His project goal calls for a fertility rate of one and a half by 2030. Kind of sounds a little bit like the climate change goals that we've been hearing about. Yeah, like the 1.5 degrees Celsius. And then, of course, uh, Valerie's idea of stop growth at 8 billion. There was the One Planet, One Child campaign that we did at World Population Balance. Stop at one. We need to put the best advertising minds on this to come up with some good names. And really, each culture needs its own project and project Mm. name anyway, right? Yeah, something that appeals to different cultures. That makes sense. Yep. Maybe we're getting close to the time being right for that. Yeah. And, you know, I think a good start would be if if people even knew what the global population was or even the population of their countries. I feel like a lot of people are ignorant about the status quo, (laughs) let alone that we need to be changing the status quo. Yeah, that's a start. I mean, and it's astonishing how many people and people in leadership positions do not understand that we are deeply into overshoot and that in today's landscape, that means that we're overpopulated. We'll talk a little bit more about that during the growth busting news. Well, before we get to the news, do you want to review some of our listener feedback? Let's do it. So Robert posted a comment about Growth Busters episode 70, which was titled Paul Ehrlich on Limits to Growth. We'll link to that episode in the show notes on our episodes page on the Growth Busters website. He wrote, as noted, 2022 is the 50th anniversary of the seminal work by Paul Ehrlich, The Limits to Growth, commissioned by the Club of Rome. I read this in college in 1974. It made a significant impact on my way of thinking and my view of the world. I have been involved in international activities in some form ever since. Some, even E.O. Wilson, have noted that population growth is slowing, even declining in some developed countries. However, it is not the absolute number of people per se that is the problem, but rather the consumption of global resources per capita. 20% of the world's population is responsible for the consumption of 80% of the planet's resources. Per capita consumption in developed countries is 5 to 10 times higher than per capita consumption in least developed countries. This means the population of least developed countries would have to be 5 to 10 times higher to reach the same consumption level in developed countries such as Europe or the U.S., Two things need to be done immediately. Number one, significant reduction of consumption in developed countries. Number two, facilitate development in least developed countries to utilize sustainable resources, particularly encouraging renewable energy. Keep up the great work. Fantastic job with the podcast as always. Okay, well, I'm sure you noticed this. We do need to offer a little bit of a correction. Uh, The Limits to Growth study commissioned by the Club of Rome wasn't uh, by Paul Ehrlich. We certainly had Paul on in our last episode to talk about the limits to growth. What Paul Ehrlich is famous for is one of his over 40 books that he wrote was The Population Bomb. But the limits to growth wasn't a Paul Ehrlich project. And then he gets a lot right, but I think there's some things that we want to clarify a little bit. Yeah, and I think, Dad, you you wrote a a response on the episode page as well. Did you want to read that? Yep, I might as well. What I wrote was, thanks for sharing your thoughts, Robert. Overconsumption by those of us in the overdeveloped world is no doubt a huge contributor to our being in overshoot. We want to work on that. However, let's not fall into the trap of feeling we have to choose only one contributor to address. If per capita consumption is a problem, then the number of per capitas obviously has an impact. And while people in yet-to-be-overdeveloped nations have much smaller footprints, they want and deserve to live decent lives, which will enlarge their footprints. So it is important to consider how many people the planet can support at a modest but decent lifestyle. Every smart inquiry I've seen into this arrives at a number of 3 billion or less. Correcting the overconsumption of the rich world 
while important, doesn't get us out of overshoot. Eight billion people would have to live like paupers in order to avoid killing the planet. So let's support smart policies and informed decision making about levels of consumption, economic growth, and family planning. Very smart response, Dad. I, I really liked your phrase, people in yet to be overdeveloped nations, because that does seem to be the track that all the nations are taking, right? Yeah. And I think, you know, he sort of, you know, indicated it would be nice to have them develop uh, using renewable energy. But, you know, that's not nearly enough. They need to, in many respects, not make the same mistakes we made. And at top of the list is uh, becoming obsessed with economic growth, with uh, GDP growth. Can't do it. And that's one reason why just kind of relaxing about overpopulation in the yet-to-be-overdeveloped world and saying, let's just let them develop because then their fertility rate will drop. It's just not a good strategy because as they develop, <laughs> their consumption is going to be the same big problem that it is in the currently overdeveloped countries. So I think people make the mistake of sort of just looking at this snapshot in time, the way the world is today. Uh, they don't anticipate what it could look like if, by some stretch of the imagination, you know, we can stretch the rubber band enough that the billions of people in the yet-to-be-overdeveloped world were to live decent lives and unfortunately go down the road of uh, seeking the crazy American dream that we know is not a very good dream. It's really a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Well, let's see. Uh, James from Australia emailed us and he wrote, I was wondering if you have ever seen a supplier who offers a limits to growth t-shirt. I was thinking something along the lines of the usual world three model curves with a you are here pointer. Anything similar with just the population or economic growth curves that carries the same message would be just as good. Wow, that's a great idea. I love it. I love it. Well, I did a search and I didn't turn up anything currently available. So I'm tempted what I did find, though, Stephanie, was, you'll find this interesting, a Ronald Reagan t-shirt with this relatively famous Ronald Reagan quote, there are no great limits to growth because there are no limits of human intelligence, imagination, and wonder. Sounds like a Reaganism. <laughs> yeah. And I'm not going to put a link to that garbage in the show notes unless you want to order one of those t-shirts and burn it. Maybe a ritual burning of some kind. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> but I hate to waste the resources. Yep. All right. Well, thanks for the note, James. We love hearing from everyone. Email your comments and questions to podcast at growthbusters.org, or you can even call us and record a voice message that we could play on our next episode. Just call 719-402-1400. All right. It's time for Honey, I Shrunk My Footprint, and then we'll get into the growth busting news, which has got some really good stuff today. So have you found some exemplary way to shrink your footprint to share? Yes, <laughs> but not really. I need to think about it for one second. Oh, okay. You want me to go first? Yeah. You know, I tend to get obsessive compulsive about this footprint shrinking stuff. And this is a great example of this. It's been driving me absolutely crazy watching people at the refrigerator. My wife, I watch, <laughs> and uh, occasionally we have a guest or someone in there. And I watch them when they, they go to the refrigerator to get something. They open the door as if they're completely unaware of the fact that all the cold air in that refrigerator is escaping pretty darn fast, especially if you open the door very far, and certainly if you keep the door open very long. So my obsessive compulsive footprint shrinking behavior that I want to share is that I think about that every time I get something out of the refrigerator. I try my best to have that door open as little, you know, not to open it any farther than necessary and to get it closed as soon as possible. So the refrigerator doesn't use the electricity, which, you know, creates the carbon emissions to cool down the air because you let all the cold air out. So I obsess about that. And I see other people just don't even think about it. Stephanie, do you think about it? I definitely think about it because I was <laughs> raised in your household. Um, Good for you. you've, been, <laughs> you've been kind of drilling that into me since I was a child. But you know, my fiance, he stands there in front of the fridge with it wide open. He'll even get distracted and start a conversation with me. And, <laughs> and so I'm, you know, my eyes just get wider and wider and wider as I'm seeing all of this. And, I, and then, you know, I tell him like, shut the fridge. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> I did gift him 
This was a few years ago and we haven't, we need to hire an electrician to install it, but I gifted him a electricity monitor that you can have put on your electric box and then it has an app and it's kind of cool because it, it's smart enough to recognize the different signals of all of the things you have plugged in in your house. And so after a few days, it can start to tell you, oh, this is how much energy your fridge is using. This is how much energy your microwave and, you know, all the different things. And so uh, we should be probably getting that installed in the fall. And I'm hoping that maybe once he has this cool app and all this data, he'll start to really more connect the dots of, you know, the fridge uses this much and, you know, I can reduce that by making sure I'm shutting the, the door and not leaving it wide open all the time, but... Baby steps. <laughs> you know, it's classic teenage behavior. Teenagers are <laughs> notorious for just opening their refrigerator door and standing there trying to figure out, what do I want? Let's see. What well, looks good? Somebody out there listening, you may be thinking, that is so tiny. One person in one house with the refrigerator door open for 30 seconds. Come on, Dave. Well, you know what? Around the world, gosh, there might be 700 million refrigerators open and if they're open longer than necessary, that's just a waste, you know? Mm -hmm. It's not doing any good. It's not making the world a better place. It's just wasting our carbon emission quota. Yep. All right. Well, mine is we have a seasonal farmer's market. I live in, in Quincy, Massachusetts, and there's actually a couple farmer's markets this year, which is great. And one of them I can walk to. So it started running, I think, June 17th or something like that. And so every week I've been walking down. It's about a 15-minute walk. Grab my fresh local produce for the week and walk home. So trying to eat locally, support local farmers, and take fewer trips to the grocery store and definitely fewer car trips. So that's mine. Well done. It's a great summertime activity, too, for sure. Oh, and the food is just, you just can't beat it. It doesn't taste anything like the junk we get from the grocery store. All right. Should we talk about some growth-busting news items? I think we should. They're important, so stick around. All right. So leaked Amazon memo warns the company is running out of people to hire. <laughs> I guess there was this report from 2021 that was leaked, even though this Vox article was published recently. But the report says that it could run out of people to hire in its U.S. warehouses by 2024. And in a few specific locales, the company could potentially exhaust its entire available labor pool by the end of 2021, for example, in Phoenix, Arizona. It sounds like this could potentially be a big problem for Amazon, and there's several reasons why. One is that they have this insane turnover rate of their employees. So they just churn through people. That rate is somewhere between 100% to 159% year over year. Jeez. And so this memo kind of was outlining the different things Amazon could do to extend their timeline that they're going to run out of people. Treat them better. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Like raising wages. <laughs> Apparently, Amazon has this crazy automation of their HR system. So if people have some sort of infraction, they can get fired automatically <laughs> and HR can't even like intervene. It's just it's like, nope, this our computers calculated that you did this wrong and you're gone. So anyway, it was, it was really interesting to read all these details and we'll link to this in the show notes so you can take a look as well. But my takeaway from this one is just that this company is too large. It's churning through people. It's churning through our planet's resources. And to me, it's kind of like a metaphor for how our economy works and how we're going to run out. We're going to run out of planet and people if we have this Amazon business model. What did you think of this one, Dad? Well, what struck me was, well, no wonder billionaires think that the world is underpopulated and want us to get busy making more babies. Because they not only need an endless supply of more consumers, but they're afraid they're going to run out of workers to abuse. Not to mention resources. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Oh, but we'll have to go to Mars for that. So next on the list is, speaking of billionaires, uh, Elon Musk breaks silence on birth of secret twins with overpopulation joke. There's been claims that Elon Musk fathered twins with one of his company executives. So he uh, confirmed that with a tweet. So Elon Musk is up to nine kids. And what's really disgusting, well, you know, in some ways, I hate to 
what would you call it? Overbirth shame or breeder shame or whatever you want to call it, somebody for being ignorant and therefore reproducing irresponsibly. But you know what? There's going to come a time where we're just going to have to get over that and shame somebody. You know, Elon Musk, a lot of people think he's pretty smart. So he should know better. And he should certainly know better than to tweet this. He tweeted, Doing my best to help the underpopulation crisis. A collapsing birth rate is the biggest danger civilization faces by far. A couple tweets later, he wrote, I hope you have big families and congrats to those who already do. Therefore, proving that Elon Musk is not anywhere near as smart as some people think he is. (laughs) Just ridiculous. He ought to know better. He's just such a techno-optimist, it's crazy. And of course, his... I guess his big solution to the uh, destruction uh, of the ecosystems on our current home planet is to move to Mars. Well, life on Mars ain't going to be all that great. Not as great as life on Earth used to be. Exactly. We'll put a link to this story about Musk's stupid tweeting, but also a link to a really great piece that Population Matters published called Elon Musk is Wrong, We Need Smaller Families. And this was put out last year in response to some inane comments that uh, Elon Musk made about underpopulation. So really good and important reading. And next up, climate damage caused by growing space tourism needs urgent mitigation. It's sort of a, a review of a scientific paper that was published in the journal Earth's Future by uh, researchers from the University College London, the University of Cambridge, and Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. These researchers used a 3D model to explore the impact of rocket launches and re-entry, real data from 2019, and then the impact of projected space tourism scenarios based on all of the recent billionaire space race news that we've talked about on this podcast as well. Who thought we were ever going to have to do these calculations? (laughs) I know. (laughs) Are we in the future finally? (laughs) (laughs) Apparently, just like that. But, you know, the the highlight here is that this research team found that black carbon soot particles emitted by rockets are almost 500 times more efficient at holding heat in the atmosphere than all other sources of soot combined, resulting in an enhanced climate effect. And, you know, right now there's not very many of these space tourism flights. And in fact, there's only about 100 rocket launches a year, uh, I I assume, to get satellites and things like that into space. But, you know, Virgin Atlantic is talking about, you know, doing daily space flights for tourism purposes. So the researchers are saying, you know, this has important implications for the ozone layer um, and greenhouse gases. And, you know, mitigating that impact needs to be part of the discussion of space tourism as it starts to grow. Yeah, apparently this is uh, much worse than international air travel. It's much more climate uh, impacting. And space tourism, I would put that up there in kind of the fringe recreation category, that's for sure. Yep. Yachting. Cool stuff. Wish we could do it. Nuclear-powered sky hotels. (laughs) (laughs) Great segue. Tell us about that, Dad. (laughs) Yeah, I couldn't believe this. Introducing Sky Cruise, a nuclear-powered hotel suspended above the clouds. This futuristic Sky Hotel gives you the ultimate travel experience. It's big enough to accommodate over 5,000 guests. Its sleek design combines the features of a commercial plane while offering the epitome of luxury. The main entertainment deck is perfect for recreational activities. It features shopping malls, sports centers, swimming pools, restaurants, bars, playgrounds for children, theaters, and cinemas. Wow, sign me up. I I (laughs) want to go. (laughs) This is so crazy. This is just like so ridiculous. I can't even take it remotely seriously. Fortunately, it is just in the concept stage today. You know, it's crazy enough that we've got these big cruise ships where we're burning fossil fuels to move a hotel and casino around the ocean. You know, where it could just be sitting still somewhere. <laughs> and and then you still have the air conditioning and a lot of other things, but at least you aren't moving it, you know, because there's some <laughs> some novelty 
to that. We're going to put a link in the show notes to the crazy YouTube video. And this thing goes on to brag about 20 electric engines powered by clean nuclear energy. So the plane can be in flight for years without ever having to land. And people and, and supplies are apparently delivered by regular airplanes. Yeah, that docks with it. <laughs> you know what? If we didn't have just this one planet, and if we didn't have nearly 8 billion people polluting the hell out of it and uh, depleting our life-supporting ecosystems, then maybe this could be something fun to think of. But planet of 8 billion, not an option. Agreed. What's next? So there's a new book out by George Monbiot. Uh, it's called Regenesis, Feeding the World Without Devouring the Planet. And uh, Dad, you found a good review of this book that's titled Let Them Eat Fermented Protein. It's a review by Dan Saladino. Monbiot is proposing that we pretty much eliminate agriculture, especially animal agriculture. And we we basically eat these 3D printed bacterial created protein cakes <laughs> um, in order to solve the planetary crisis of overshoot. <laughs> this really reminded me of Soylent Green, right? Like yeah. things are getting so out of control and out of hand that we're having to eat lab created food that isn't really even food. Yeah. Bacteria pancakes. Yum, yum, yum. Clearly, Agriculture is responsible for a huge part of the climate disruption that we're currently doing. And that's sort of a big headline, and that's a big thing to Monbiot. But Monbiot refuses to acknowledge that the number of people on the planet could be an issue. So in order to avoid acknowledging that and addressing human overpopulation, he thinks we should uh, you know, go to this kind of extreme to take away the joys of life. <laughs> he would rather we live in that soylent green world where we eat this manufactured world. You know, maybe the chemists can figure out a way to make it kind of smell and taste reminiscent of the, you know, just the basic joys <laughs> of growing some food on the land and throwing it on the barbecue. That's uh, just, wow. Do we really have to make those kind of sacrifices because we're afraid to discuss our moral obligation to keep our procreation in check? Yeah, and I, I think that he's painting a picture of what our future could look like if folks believe in this techno fix idea and not willing to talk about population, not willing to talk about overconsumption and economic growth and our our entire system not being good for people and planet you know this is the future that we might be living in where we eat bacterial pancakes is is that the future that we all want yeah so i'm not going to put a link to that book in the show notes but i will put a link to the good review so next up, uh, Paul and Ann Ehrlich have published a new paper, and that's really big news because Ann uh, co-wrote a lot of books with Paul over the decades, but uh, she hasn't been that active recently. And so for her to uh, participate in some writing is really good news. And this new paper, Returning to Normal, Evolutionary Roots of the Human Prospect. It's not a terribly long read. It's available free. We'll put a link in the show notes. And it's a pretty interesting summary. A lot of things that we've heard Paul say on this podcast and in other interviews, but it's all kind of put together, kind of an explanation of their uh, observations of our culture and the things that are happening in our culture that are tripping us up. Yeah, I, I think their main thesis is that I guess they, they kind of divide human history into the last 300 years and the last 300,000 years. And the last 300 years is very abnormal compared to Homo sapiens evolutionarily. Um, I, I thought that this paper was super, super interesting. I, I'm always interested in thinking about how our kind of biology as a species is lagging behind where our culture is today and, and what those impacts are just from kind of a scientific perspective. And so I love this paper that they, they dig into that and just talk about how abnormal our culture is and the way that we are living on the planet today. And they give credit to Nate Higgins for this neat uh, concept that I hadn't heard about before, which is that we are addicted to the present. Now, if that intrigues you, uh, go to the show notes, get the link to this paper and read it. Highly recommend this one. Now, the last couple of items, Stephanie, are uh, very relevant to today's topic, so they all kind of flow together. 
Yeah, you're right. So so the next one is an op-ed by Ezra Klein that was published in the New York Times in, uh, I think it was June 5th. And the title was, Your Kids Are Not Doomed. And he brings up the, the topic that we've addressed quite a bit on, on our podcast, which is this climate anxiety that a lot of people are feeling. And the one major cause of reduced fertility rates is people are worried about climate change and both what kind of world would a kid live in if they decide to have a kid and also if their kid is going to contribute to climate change, especially if they're in a rich country. So Ezra Klein is is kind of tackling those two questions in this op-ed. And it's odd to read because on the one hand, he seems to get that you know, all of the climate scientists are giving us these dire warnings, and he seems to really understand the climate science. But on the other hand, he seems very optimistic and also has this argument that, you know what, human suffering has been this thing for pretty much all of human history, and there's great human suffering today that we ignore. And so therefore, it's okay, I guess, to keep going the way we've been going. It's a very bizarre argument. I don't know. Yeah, you know, and I guess the the bottom line takeaway, and I don't want to put too much time into it because I think it really is pretty uninformed, is I don't think he gets that we're not going to just experience uh, 3.7 degrees Fahrenheit warming this century. He doesn't get that. He still has faith that the commitments that the countries have made can be counted on. And the truth is... <laughs> The commitments aren't worth shit. (laughs) You know, nobody's living up to those commitments. So it's going to be worse than he thinks. But also, I get the impression, bottom line, that he feels pretty insulated from the troubles of the world. You know, he must live in some gated community, and he thinks he's going to somehow survive, that his air conditioning is going to work just fine. He's going to have electricity. He's going to have the internet. And hungry hordes aren't going to be storming his house looking for a morsel of food. And the apocalyptic climate catastrophe that lies ahead, I think he is just delusional about that. It doesn't make sense because he acknowledges that inequity between rich countries and poor countries and being able to, you know, weather climate change impacts and that not being equal. Like, it's so weird. He acknowledges like all of these realities about how bad climate change is and how unfair the impacts are. And then he kind of is like, but whatever. Well, what he didn't write, but between the lines is, well, we're in the rich company, so we don't need to worry about it. (laughs) We're not going to feel it. So relax and have kids. (laughs) Your kids are going to be just fine. (laughs) This one was just mind boggling to me. Really, really bizarre. Yeah, and contrast that with this other news item that also came out in June. Current policies will bring catastrophic climate breakdown, warn former UN leaders. We'll put two links in the show notes. One is to the uh, news story about this, and then the other is to what what the, the news is, is that there was an opinion piece published in The Guardian written by three past IPCC leaders. (laughs) <laughs> who probably know quite a bit, <laughs> you know, and they are talking about catastrophic climate breakdown. They're not writing about relax <laughs> in your air conditioned <laughs> suburban gated community, Ezra. <laughs> And that brings us to the way I really want to end this episode with a, an interesting clip. Uh, there's a movie on at the movie theaters right now, the latest in the Jurassic Park or Jurassic World series of films. And in a, I just happened across a clip where Jeff Goldblum's character, Dr. Ian Malcolm, said something that I just think sums it up succinctly. So let me share that with you. I gave my opinion robustly for years, as expected. The sum of our human endeavors has led to our annihilation. And the only play now is to take the time we have left and, uh, you know, just like we always do, squander it. (laughs) (laughs) Too real. Too real. It would be funny if it wasn't so darn true. (laughs) (laughs) So leave you with those words of wisdom. So that brings us to the end of another thrilling episode of the Growth Busters podcast. You know, having intelligent conversations about overpopulation is so important. So please share this episode with people you love or just people who need to learn about overpopulation. And be sure to follow the podcast on your podcast app so you don't miss an episode. 
Thanks to Jake Fader for writing and producing the Growthbusters theme you hear at the open and close of this podcast, and to Carlos Jones for singing it. Learn more about the issues we discuss in this podcast at growthbusters.org. That homepage is also where you can donate or get on our email list. And if civilization doesn't collapse first, we'll see you next time. Some may dream to paint mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Some may just want more, but don't know what it's for, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution. They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather. But no, not us. We are the growth busters. Calling, 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 calling. Call the growth busters.